ओम ज्ञान ज्ञानाजलिशलाकाय चक्षुरोन्मलत तस्म श्रीगुर नम नम ओं विष्णुपाय कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदात स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देव गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देश तारिणे वाचाकूभ कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिताभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 रामा हरे रामा राम रामा हरे 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 कृष्णा सो ग्रेटफुल टू बी हियर विद ऑल ऑफ यू टुडे एंड दिस सेक्शन इट्स आई आई टेक दिस क्लास इन थ्री ब्रॉड पार्ट्स फर्स्ट आई टॉक अबाउट व्हाट इज ब्रॉडली गोइंग ऑन in this section of the bhagavatam i'll be very briefly then second what is going on in this verse particularly and then lastly we'll focus in detail on on prabhupad's way of commenting on the bhagavatam and what we can learn from it so this is the third chapter of the 10th canto and in this section krishna has appeared in the world through the womb of devaki and devaki and vasudeva are going to offer prayers so from the 24th text onwards devaki is offering her prayers to the lord so in fact the lord is actually her a child who has come from her womb he is not like a ordinary baby who is crying he is looking attractive divinely attractive and she will speak from 24th text to 31st text the lord will reply from the 32nd text onwards and then the lord will give specific directions to them what to do so they have spoken they have given spoken and then the chapter will move on so in the 10th canto primarily it it begins with events in mathura then major events are in vrindavan so the first three chapters in the 10th canto are in mathura the next 37 chapters the action is happening in vrindavan and then from the 41st chapter again the action returns to mathura and then of course it goes to dwarka and everywhere else as krishna travels so here the scene is the prison in which krishna has appeared and in this particular verse let's see what's happening here krishna is being offered prayers by his mother martyo mrityu vyal bitah palayan so martyo everybody is destined to die in this world मृत्यु व्याल भीत परायन पलायन पलायन इज टू फ्ली मृत्यु व्याल व्याल इज अर्पंट क्वाइट ऑफन अमोंग द वेरियस प्रेटरी एनिमल्स दैट ह्यूम आर एंडेंजर्ड बाय स्नेक इज समटाइम्स कंसिडर्ड टू बी द मोस्ट डेंजरस बिकॉज इट कैन स्नीक ऑन अ टाइगर और अ लायन और समथिंग लाइक दैट कैन सी इट कमिंग बट अ स्नेक कैन जस्ट स्नीक अलॉन्ग द ग्राउंड एंड सडनली अटैक सो even in the biblical tradition satan comes in the form of a snake to tempt eve and then adam so mrityu vyal bhita palayan so with the serpent of death everybody is in fear bhita and is fleeing from it lokan sarvan nirbhayam nadya gachhat lokan sarvan all the people in this world they run from this serpent of death and they nirbhayam this is, so bhita is fear nirbhayam is no fear shri prabhu pa's name was abhay abhay charanarvind abhay and nirbhay are similar so no fear na adhyagachat but just one does not obtain fearlessness anywhere in this world tat padabhyam prapi yatru chayadya but somehow we may run all over the world all over the universe in fact lokan sarvan wherever we may go we will not find fearlessness tat padabjam but if somehow we can attain your lotus feet this is devaki praying to krishna 
prapi adrichayadya and this is not in our control whether we will attain those lotus feet or not adrichaya by my, now adrichaya is a very general word which refers to things beyond human control now prabhupad sometimes packs a lot of purport even in his translations so thus that which is beyond in our, our control could be called as chance or it could call be called as destiny it could be called as the mercy of the lord whichever word prabhupad uses two of them over here yadrichaya adya adya means when that is attained sushtah shete mrityur asmad apaiti at that time one becomes sushtah one becomes undisturbed one is peace, peaceful mrityu asmad apaiti so in fact shete actually means to sleep now in one sense sleeping is the opposite of fleeing now if we are extremely fearful one of the first casualties of anxiety is sleep insomnia is often associated with a lot of anxiety so here when it is said that you are sleeping you can sleep pe- sleep peacefully that means fear is absent one can peacefully sleep now this is a interesting metaphor because normally we talk about spiritual growth as awakening there is a famous song of chaitanya mahaprabhu jeev jago jeev jago wake up o sleeping soul but here it's interesting that the spiritually advanced stage is compared to a peaceful sleeping stage the idea is it is not the point is not of lack of consciousness or dreaminess as it is in sleep the point is peacefulness complete free from fear, freedom from fear it's like a baby when there's a newborn baby the baby feels that I, i'm in the hands of a stranger the baby may cry but when the baby feels oh i am with my mother the baby feels peace when the baby just goes to sleep when she feels comfortable and safe so that comfort safety fearlessness is what is being talked about so the the point of this verse is twofold one is this in this world there is constant fear no matter where we run in this world we will not become free from fear but if somehow we attain the shelter of the lord then we can become as free from fear as if we were peacefully sleeping uh, in, a, in our mother's uh, mother's arms or a mother's lap something like that so now prabhupad covers a lot of territory in his purport and uh, i'll focus on one theme so if we see sometimes prabhupad's purport it's a little difficult to see what he is connecting with what i'll just give a quick glimpse before we move to the main point so prabhupad begins by talking about how everyone is afraid of death and he says throughout the universe the point that all over the universe when uh, palayan we may go all over the universe so first he talks about traveling by traditional means traditional means means to transmigration one may go to a higher planetary system but that will not free one from distress but then only when one attains the shelter of the lord and then yadruchaya that point prabhupad connects with the famous verse in chaitanya charitamrit brahmanda brahmite and then it's almost like a passing point more or less prabhupad has addressed the entire purport or the entire verse the two parts of the verse our condition of death in this world and our the condition of going beyond the fear of death and then almost as a pass, passing point he says it may be noted that the moon is one of the heavenly planets and then he talks about uh, about the moon mission so for many of us this could be quite controversial and we will focus on that part so the first point i will address this in three points three three with prabhu i will not talk so much about prabhupada's position on the moon i'll talk about that also but first is what is prabhupad trying to do over here mm-hmm. then second is what was prabhupad's purpose in trying to do what he is doing and third is how can that purpose be fulfilled today okay so shri prabhupad is among the first acharyas 
if not among i would say he is the first acharya who actually had to who had such who had to actually address the bhagavatam to an audience so different from his original audience from the bhagavatam's original audience so most of the previous acharyas they wrote commentaries for people in india who were very familiar with the overall bhagavatam ethos and that is why if you see vishwanath chakravarti thakur or shrinath chakravarti in our tradition shrinath chakravarti thakur who wrote chaitanya manjushra is the first commentator on the shrimad bhagavatam jeeva goswami wrote a kama sandarbha which is not exactly a verse by verse commentary although he has given annotations on many verses of the bhagavatam but right there from jeeva goswami and shrinath chakravarti down to the recent acharyas bhakti nath thakur bhakti nath thakur Now, most of them when they were writing spirit, commentary on scripture they were basically commenting on scripture they're explaining what this verse means what was this verse doesn't mean because prabhupada's audience was so different from the traditional audience of the bhagavatam prabhupada in one sense had to do something unprecedented in order to make his bhagavatam commentary more relevant, more intelligible to his audience and what was that prabhupad actually had to he bro- integrated social commentary with spiritual commentary social commentary means he said he commented on social issues he commented on issues that are there in people's minds even if those issues were not directly there in the bhagavata the social commentary was so strikingly absent in the previous tradition this i'll give an indication of that is to indicate what a formidable challenge prabhupad had and how he addressed it now those of you who know about indian history i'll using a black uh, powerpoint which also black as a white board those of you know a little bit about indian history India was colonized by the British for about two hundred years, and before that, it was ruled by Islamic invaders for about eight hundred years. So during the time of, especially the Islamic rule, there was a lot of devastation of the holy places. So one of the most prominent, prominent Bhagavatam commentators, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, and Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, he wrote his commentaries in Rindavan. just a few decades after the whole of rindavan had been had been destroyed by one of the most uh, intolerant uh, of the mughal rulers his name was aurangzeb and and chakravarti pad had to restore everything from the ashes and yet in, in his commentaries chakravarti pad not once mentions anything about aurangzeb why because that was not relevant he felt at that time books were very rare and books were written by scholars for scholars so he didn't feel it relevant at that time but by the time of prabhupa books were widely read the printing press and other revolutions made books writing very much more accessible than what is in the past so prabhupa bring in social commentary in many many of his purports and the point is he wants his audience to see how scripture relates with the current world so the point of prabhupad is we could say making scripture relevant that's the purpose so in the past the spiritual culture the vedic culture of india the vedic wisdom was its relevance was already known to people so th- that challenge was not there for the previous acharyas but this was a challenge for prabhupada now with this point in mind that prabhupada integrated social commentary in spiritual commentary so social commentary could mean it could mean sociological issues such as uh, he could talk about how society has been organized what form of government should be there or what about the current political upheavals or he could talk about here for example scientific developments so now this brings us to another important point about relevance 
Hmm? Now, one of the challenges of being relevant is what is relevant keeps changing. And the stand of the tradition may also keep changing. What do I mean by this? Let me explain this two points. So let's consider Shri Prabhupada when he talks about in the Bhagavata, in the Ishopanishad purports, when the principle is about the first verse of the Ishopanishad is Prabhupada is talking about Isha Vasivinam Sarvam, that everything is owned by the Supreme Lord, everything belongs to the Supreme, the Isha Vasi principle. And there Prabhupada talks about how communists and capitalists are fighting. Now, if you consider this, during the time of Prabhu, when Prabhupada was writing this commentary, the world, the Cold War was probably at its peak, and uh, when exactly the peak was, it could be very, it could be debated. But the Cold War was very much there in people's minds, and thus Prabhupada spoke about the communists and capitalists, and he says that they don't accept that ultimately the ultimate proprietary principle is the divine. They will fight and they will destroy each other. And the world can have no peace either by this, this ism or that ism. Now this was Prabhupada making relevant the scripture at that time. But is the same thing relevant today? Well, communism is not real. The Cold War is no longer there. There are other kinds of wars which have suddenly burst into human consciousness in the last few months with the Ukraine-Russia uh, conflict. Uh, but the point is the Cold War is not. So does that make Prabhupada's purport irrelevant? No. The example was current at that time. And that example may not apply now. But the principle remains relevant. So that's why I said, what is relevant? Whenever we try to make something relevant, it keeps changing. What is relevant keeps changing. But the principle that is being made relevant it doesn't change. That's why there is, when we are studying scripture, it's important to understand if he's analyzing scriptural commentary. When say Prabhupada is commenting on scripture. So is this a point of Siddhanta? Siddhanta is core philosophy. You could say more of philosophical conclusion. Or is this an application of Siddhanta? Uh, and that means application of the philosophy. So what happens is the application of philosophy can vary from time, place, circumstance. The core philosophy does not change. The application of philosophy can and will change. So let me explain this. So Shri Prabhupada talks about, example, we can say seven purposes of ISKCON. Hmm. And this is a foundational document of what Prabhupada's purpose was in establishing this international movement. Now, in this, he talks about publishing books, periodicals, magazines, pamphlets. Now, he doesn't mention anything about publishing uh, internet blogs or having websites or having YouTube channels or having Facebook and social media. Now, does that mean that's not included? Well, the idea is sharing the message. Now, how the principle is of sharing the message. If somebody says, Prabhupada's purpose is never to be on social media. Then there's no need to use social media at all. No need to use the internet. Because Prabhupada didn't mention it. No, that wouldn't work. So there is Siddhanta and there is application of Siddhanta. There is philosophy and there's the application of philosophy. So we need to analyze what is going on where. And the philosophy can be applied in different contexts in different ways to different contexts in different ways. When Prabhupada is trying to make philosophy relevant, what is he doing? He is taking a particular context and applying the philosophy to that context. Now, if we consider, let's take another application. I'm giving all these examples before we come to this uh, issue of the moon. Mm -hmm. So application of scripture, if you consider. Applying scripture. Uh, or application of Siddhanta, if you say. 
So now, when Shri Prabhupada, she took positions on social issues, for example, on say forms of government. Sometimes we as sometimes we as devotees may want complicated issues reduced or made accessible through simple sound bites. But this doesn't work. What do I mean? That okay, what is Prabhupada's position on a particular issue? We say this is what Prabhupada said. Well, one of the principles is you want to understand. His application and look at the broad spectrum of what all he has said. And so, if we try to reduce everything to simple sound bites, then there is a problem because Prabhupada may have used that particular sound bite at a particular place, but he may use something completely different in another place. So, for example, some devotees may like to quote Prabhupada said, "Democracy is demon crazy." Now it's interesting that this is not. From, I just recently came to this is not a historically. This may or may not be something which Prabhupada had coined himself. Now, there was another Indian spiritual leader who has said something like this before, and Prabhupada could have adopted it from him, or Prabhupada could have come up with it on his own. Whatever it is, if somebody said, "What if somebody asked, did Prabhupada support democracy?" No, he says it's demon crazy. And was that all that Prabhupada said about it? Is that Prabhupada's position on democracy? Well, that would be a very short-sighted and self-destructive thing to say. Why? Because Prabhupada engaged with whoever he had opportunity with. When Prabhupada had opportunity with, to interact with the Indian heads of state, he had opportunities twice: one with Indira Gandhi and another with Moraji Desai. Both of them were premiers of Prime Minister of India. And on neither occasion did Prabhupada say, you know, you are what you are a demon, and what you are doing is demon crazy. No, Prabhupada engaged them in a way that could that could foster Krishna consciousness. Of course, neither of the meetings circumstantially worked out very well. But the point is, when Prabhupada is applying Siddhanta, we could just take one application or one sound bite based on one application and absolutize it, and that would be quite dangerous. So conversely, when Prabhupada was talking about us about communism, sometimes he took the word spiritual communism, and when he used the word spiritual communism, so for example, when he was in Kolkata, Kolkata was traditionally in India the uh, hotbed of leftist ideologies, extreme leftist ideologies, not just communism but Marxism, and uh, so when Prabhupada was having a big Pandal program, a huge program with twenty, thirty thousand people coming. At that time, some of these extremists, left-wing extremists, they came and they tried to threaten Prabhupada and threaten the program, and they came prepared for violence. And then Prabhupada talked with them. Everybody, all his uh, pelvishers and even disciples, said, "Don't talk with them; they are dangerous people." Prabhupada said, "No, I talk with them." And Prabhupada told them that actually, you are propagators of communism, and we are not. A, we are also what Krishna is also is a form of communism. It's spiritual communism. I talked about how only a small change instead of everything being the property of the state, say everything is the property of God. Now, for, for now, it seems very neat and delicate, or it seems very neat. But actually, if you study communism, in the among all the ideologies in the world, probably whichever whichever ideologies we can have. In terms of geopolitical administration, uh, communism was the most aggressively atheistic. Uh, Karl Marx famously said, "Religion is the opium of the masses." So, of course, today we could say that in today's world, atheism is or can also be the opium of the masses, because that can also intoxicate people to denying reality. So, the point is, can we say Prabhupada supported communism by saying that he talked about spiritual communism? Well, it's not that simple. Prabhupada knew how communism was opposed, and Prabhupada knew when he was trying to build a temple, planetarium, and that big grand temple in Mayapur, how the local communist government would oppose. So Prabhupada's position on communism cannot be reduced. That he, he said, yeah, that's good. Just make it spiritual communism. A Prabhupada's democracy is demon crazy. So these are complicated issues. We will look at everything that Prabhupada has said, and then try to look at this various. Okay, what all statements are the applications? 
what are the various ways in which prabhupada has applied himself to the situation and thereafter we can understand okay how can the principle that prabhupada is teaching be applied over here how can that principle be applied over here when we understand that then we will be actually fulfilling the purpose of prabhupada otherwise we may even quote prabhupada's words and defeat prabhupada's purpose this can be disastrous sometimes what happens is in general the tendency is to reduce everything to externals so reducing everything to externals what does that mean that means that uh, who is faithful to prabhupada if you want to decide that somebody is a faithfulness to prabhupada let us look at how many times somebody quotes prabhupada in their lectures how many quotes of prabhupada are there in lectures oh this must be very faithful to prabhupada well not necessarily when we be quoting applications of the prabhupada did in different contexts and those applications may not be applicable in this context so we cannot just go by externals in the christian tradition as a famous theologian who said that uh, he was there was a theological debate and he said that he was in a sense talking okay, about among all of us theologians the devil is the best theologian and still he is the devil he is the best theologian and still the devil what that means is that now of course the devil is consciously evil so even if people are not consciously evil sometimes they may quote authority they may quote the bible they may quote the bhagavad gita they may quote prabhupad but are they fulfilling the purpose of prabhupad that is important otherwise we may end up doing a disservice to prabhupad by by quoting something which is not applicable in that context now what do i mean by this how could it be that we take prabhupad's words but defeat prabhupad's purpose are in prabhupad's words the way to fulfill his purpose well yes but which words which words mm-hmm. so how can how can this can seem very uh, how can quoting prabhupad's words defeat his purpose let's try to understand this so this happened right during prabhupada's time i'll take a couple of examples from those times and then we will move forward to uh, how it might happen today and then i'll examine the moon issue which we are going to discuss briefly so there was a time when when prabhupada brought devotees to vrindavan in the early days vrindavan is the is the headquarters of devotion but the fact is that vrindavan is a place of great devotion and it can also be a place of great deviation deviation why because there are many people who in vrindavan have come up with their own ideologies own apasiddhantas place of devotion and place of deviation so what happened is when the devo- some of the devotees uh when they came to rinda when they started going to various shops over there and getting this book and reading that book and reading that book and they were re- getting mostly books by the previous acharyas bhakti nath thakur's books bhakti nath thakur's books vishwanath thakur's books, books, books jiva goswami the goswami's books and then prabhupad came to know about it he said that they were reading this and reading that and reading that and now most of these devotees were just one or two years in in krishna consciousness maybe three years at the most and prabhupad wanted them to be grounded in the basic understanding of the philosophy otherwise they can get very confused it's like some nowadays we say why can't i read a book which i want to well that's fine you can read which your book you want to nobody is taking away your freedom to read but the point is if somebody wants education if say a student who is in second grade says that i want to read the phd level book right now well okay nobody is going to persecute you if you want to read a phd level book but can you understand it isn't it likely that you'll get confused you may get intimidated so many things which are considered to be like bedrock truths like 3 minus 7 is not possible in second it's possible when you go to 7th or 8 it's minus 5 negative numbers enter in the third time it is so much confusion and contradiction 
So Prabhupada was Prabhupada was annoyed and he said that instead of reading all these books from here and there, it is better that these books be burned and they focus on reading my books. And the next day Prabhupada was, that evening Prabhupada came out for the evening darshan and he saw that the devotees had lit, lit something like a bonfire. So what are they doing? He, says, he said, they, they are burning all the previous Acharya's books. Prabhupada said, what? It's just nonsense. These are previous Acharya's books, they are worshipable for us. And Prabhupada said, for Prabhupada, you should, it's better these books are burned. Prabhupada said, Krishna consciousness means common sense. The point of the common sense was read read the basic books first, not then burn those books. So what happens is sometimes when we quote Prabhupada to uh, to defeat the purpose of Prabhupada, this also happened in the devotees uh, where uh, actually they're distributing books and book distribution was going on a very big way, and devotees found that they could. They were more accessible to people. People would be less intimidated about approaching them if they wore the local civil clothes rather than the dhoti kurta, the sari. So when they did that, some of the followers of Prabhupada are a little discontented, and they said that they are going back to the devotees are going back to their hippie ways. And Prabhupada, when he heard this, he said that that's going to happen. No, and nobody, all of you, everybody should wear only dhoti kurta and sari, and then they go out and distribute books. And then some of this was some of the leaders they went and met Prabhupada from America to India, and they said that you know our distribution will get decreased by 50% because most people will, will not even let us approach them if they see us dress is so alien. This was in the 1970s. And he said, Prabhupada, then they're, they're not going back to the hippie ways. They're not being disheveled, they're not wearing disheveled, they're not being unkempt, wearing disheveled, smelly, nasty, smelly kind of clothes. No, they're wearing respectable civil clothes. So Prabhupada, that is okay. So what was happening was Prabhupada quoted now these universities are very circumstantial things. And this is not really quoting Prabhupada def defeat the purpose of Prabhupada. No, I'm giving a, these examples for a particular point. This was at a time when Prabhupada was there with us and immediately something which was having a counterproductive effect based on what Prabhupada had quoted was corrected. In the first, it was corrected before something could happen, before the, any book was born. In the second, it is corrected within a few weeks. But now, unfortunately, what happens is Shri Prabhupada is not there with us. Of course, he's there with us in spirit. He's there with us in his books. He's there with us through his followers. Uh, through, uh, at the same time, he's not there with us directly to ask a question. So what may happen is we may take a quote of Prabhupada and we will take that quote and we may speak it in the wrong context. And by speaking it in the wrong context, all that we may do is we may end up, instead of attracting people toward Krishna, we may alienate people from Krishna. So, for example, now there are times when Shri Prabhupada, uh, Prabhupada spoke strongly about impersonalism. So, he did speak in terms of philosophy, he did speak strongly about those who held that the absolute truth is impersonal. And what did he say at that time? For example, he would say that this is, he used words like fools and rascals and things like that. Now, one very significant point to understand is that Prabhupada's criticism, when he criticized something, what is his purpose? So the strength of Prabhupada's, Prabhupada's criticism, it was based not so much on not based on how wrong a philosophy was, but on how likely that philosophy was to lead his disciples, his followers wrong. This difference has to be understood carefully. What is the first thing is, if you consider from the broad Vedic worldview, personalism and impersonalism, these have been two strands of thought that have come from the same tradition, Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta and Dvaita Vedanta. These are two very strong strands of thought from the Vedic tradition itself. So we could say the same book, same Bhagavad Gita, same Vedanta Sutra, it is interpreted in a different way. So Prabhupada will criticize that. 
But we could say that if you consider some of the Abrahamic expressions, especially those which are iconoclastic, those which get a perverse delight in destroying deities and desecrating temples, Prabhupada was quite mild in criticizing. Why? Because for his followers who had come from a Christian background, Christianity or Judaism or Islam, were not temptations. Those who had come to Krishna consciousness were unlikely to go off to these schools of thought. They're quite different. So how much Prabhupada strongly criticized was based not so much on how wrong that philosophy was. Say, for example, the Abrahamic conception of the deities, they strongly condemn it. They equate the deities with idols. They strongly condemn it. But Prabhupada didn't criticize that very strongly because his followers were unlikely to fall prey to that particular conception. His focus of criticism was on how likely that philosophy was to lead his followers wrong. And that's why sometimes even Gaudiya Math, which was just like a cousin organization, the organization which was filled with his own god brothers, followers of his spiritual master, he sometimes spoke critically about them because they tried to poach devotees from, poach his disciples away. So Prabhupada's statements on impersonalism were quite strong at times. But here also, the application is important. If you consider in India, and Srila Prabhupada had several life members who were supporting him. See, based on this principle, how likely a philosophy was to lead his disciples wrong? His criticism was contextual. Is this going to mislead this person? Then let me strongly expose it or point it out in spots. So when Prabhupada spoke about impersonalism, if he was speaking to people who were already dedicated to an impersonal path, so most of the life members in India who helped Prabhupada, who helped Prabhupada build any of the big temples in India, what happened with them is Prabhupada practically never spoke much about these particular people's previous spiritual affiliations. All of them were already associated, or most of them, not all of them, most of them were already affiliated with prominent impersonalist gurus in India. In fact, many of them were prominent disciples of those impersonalist gurus. And Prabhupada did not make that the central basis of his discussion with them. And Prabhupada would go to their homes for prasad. There would be these big pictures of these impersonalist gurus. On their altar, sometimes they would have some impersonal concept, deities based on impersonal conceptions. That there's a transitional conception of the deity over there. But Prabhupada focused on engaging them in service. He recognized that they're already committed to that. They're not likely to change. Uh, they've been, maybe that, that is the path they've been following for decades, maybe for generations. So but they have some seva bhav. They have some desire to serve Krishna, help build a temple, get permission, provide supports. And Prabhupada engaged them. So the idea is, what was Prabhupada's position on impersonalism? Well, it depends on what is the cause. From a philosophical perspective, yes, Prabhupada was very strong in criticizing it. From a cultural perspective, person impersonalist and personalist shared the same cultural values. Both valued temples, both valued deities, both valued the Vedas, both valued cows and cow protection. So Prabhupada depended. Prabhupada was different at different times in dealing with different people differently. And that brings us, the relevance point brings us to our discussion on the moon issue. So when Prabhupada speaks on the moon, so Prabhupada's point is not so much the moon mission. Now I have a whole separate presentation. Uh, I can send the link to that. I have on my YouTube. Of There are eight different kinds of statements Prabhupada has made on the moon. That one, one is the most famous, they didn't go to the moon. Or they, they, may, they went there, but they didn't access it. They didn't go out of the earth itself. They went there, but they just got back some stones from there. If they went there, as Prabhupada says in this purport, why are they coming back here? In the Bhagavad Gita, he says that, okay, if they went there, they have endeavored so much to raise the bodies to the heaven. But why not put some effort to raise the consciousness upwards? That will provide greater happiness. That will provide greater fulfillment, make human life more meaningful. So the point of Srila Prabhupada is, 
not so much the moon issue but prabhupa the key point is not whether human beings went to the moon or not the point is what is the optimal use of human energy so is it primarily uh, doing scientific research to or technological advancement to go to another another um, celestial object in this material world itself or is it to raise human consciousness toward krishna consciousness so now when we are speaking with our audience we have to consider what is the optimal way we can present so it's not uh, it's not the central point of krishna conscious philosophy whether humans can or can't go to the moon the point is not whether we can or whether we can't the point is is it the best use of our time and energy is it worth getting obsessed with fascinated by excited with or is there something more worthwhile for us to focus our energies on our emotions on our excitement on and prabhupad's point was focus it more on raising one's consciousness toward krishna consciousness so how to make so to, com- to complete this point prabhupad's core point so i talked about philosophy siddha uh, like i said philosophical philosophy and application of philosophy so if you consider the application philosophy is that human life is meant for spiritual growth or philosophical point we could say what is the philosophical point and what is the application of that philosophical point so the philosophical point here is human life is meant for spiritual growth human life is meant for spiritual growth that is the key philosophical point of prabhupad ji now the application of the spiritual point philosophical point in many different ways prabhupad may not just talk about uh, about the moon mission in terms of oh they can't go even if they go what is the use oh they went but they didn't do anything worthwhile so the moon the position on the moon issue is not the key point because that will be okay, prabhupad himself has different position on the moon issue the key point is okay if that's what is people's mind take that and show what would be the krishna conscious take on that the krishna conscious take is that why spend so much time and energy we think but why not okay we want to spend some time energy at least spend a fraction of that time and energy or cultivating spiritual consciousness if we do that there's so much more we can achieve in terms of human beings finding real happiness real fulfillment in life and that is prabhupad's core point so how we can fulfill that point today that would be the key question and if you understand that key point then we will be able to uh we will be able to actually fulfill the purpose of prabhupad so this is one example right from the introduction of the bhagavad gita as it is modern man has struggled very hard to reach the moon but he has not tried very hard to elevate himself spiritually if one has 50 years of life ahead of him he should engage that brief time in cultivating this practice of remembering the supreme personality of god so here prabhupada is only focusing on the point he struggled very hard he is not really going into did we elevate ourselves or did we go there or not go there that's not the key point the key point is where do we direct our human energy so the similar point we can apply when we are reading the purports where are we directing our emotional intellectual energy are we focusing on the core point that prabhupad is making or are we going on the application hey, this doesn't apply this doesn't make sense today how can prabhupad make a statement like this or do i have to to be equal to prabhupad do i have to literally accept this position at all times is there some uh, different way of applying prabhupad's statements principles at different times yes there are so if we understand then we won't get distracted we will stay focused and we will quote prabhupad and understand prabhupad in a way that we can fulfill prabhupad's purpose that is to attract everyone to raise their consciousness and to ultimately become krishna conscious so i summarize i spoke three main points today first was the 10th canto of shrimad bhagavatam here the last chap- last chapter in vinda in mathura is happening before the action will shift to vindavan and in this purport or in this translation with the comparison of how everybody is running from death but nobody can run from run away from death 
except when they take shelter of the supreme lord then one can see peacefully that and in the purport prabhupad spoke we talk about the theme of how prabhupad makes scripture relevant and three points i made in that prabhupad had a unique challenge to make scripture relevant to audience utterly different from the traditional audience to for whom the bhagavatam commentators were writing previously and so one the thing he did was he integrated social commentary into spiritual commentary and when we try to make something relevant it's implicit that relevance itself is changing because society is changing and we are trying to make things relevant to a changing society so we can't reduce prabhupad's statements on say complex geopolitical uh, or socio political uh, philosophies like our ways of governance just democracy to demon crazy or communism to spiritual communism we, we can't reduce it to sound bites and then it discussed about last year about the moon issue prabhupad's point was not to in, insist that this is what being faithful to prabhupad being faithful to shastra means that go that application of scripture application of philosophy of siddhanta that can vary the core philosophical point is that we humans are meant to use our energy for raising consciousness towards krishna and that is what we should focus on in our study of scripture and in our sharing of scripture with others thank you very much hare krishna thank you very much itan charan prabhu please tell us briefly about akshaya tritya and uh, yeah. also yeah. please tell us if we can have your uh, slides somehow maybe there is a link devotees are asking sure. where sure. they can download them right away right away so in the vedic calendar there are many different festivals so akshaya tritya is a festival where this is also an example of you could say how relevance will change mm-hmm. right this is a time when the lord becomes when the summer is at its peak and in traditional um, indian society one of the ways to cool the lord is by applying chandan so sandalwood when is applied that is uh, what is uh, considered to be the way to cool the lord so there is a long story of madhavendra puri which i'll not go into at this point we won't have the time for that but the point is that it is at this time about 5 600 years ago that the tradition started in this particular context with in a it's a bigger tradition across the country in vedic culture of applying chandan to the lord in the time of from the akshaya tritya onwards and there are various other festivals that the festivities but the whole idea is providing relief for the lord from the heat so in our particular tradition what happens is we apply chandan to the lord and the symbolism is that uh, the indication is that it's hot and we help the lord become cool so we will see the deities decorated in many different ways i'm sure in a future class the madhavendra puri past time other related past times can also be discussed okay thank you very much hare krishna so i send a link to the youtube video where it's a powerpoint presentation is there great beautiful you yeah, don't have much time for questions but maybe we can take one yes one please. burning question from the audience no okay our 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 devotees are very smart they understand everything they 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 took it Uh, Chitan Chan Prabhu, uh, what I like about your classes is that you offer a very reasonable, commonsensical perspective on 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 really uh, seemingly controversial things and making them relevant. Thank you so much for that. That's your unique feature. I really, really admire you and love you. Thank you so much for being who you are, for taking the time to uh, spend with us. We look forward to your next class next month. Thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada ki jai. Shrimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Chitan Charan Prabhu ki jai. Common sense ki jai. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> Happy Akshay Chai Chai everybody. Haribo. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you.